Okay, thank you so much for the invitation and for the introduction. And to all of you for coming out on this rainy, humid day. It was torrential rain in Boston this morning coming down. Um, I appreciate you having me here. Essentially, uh, we're a basic neurobiology lab. But um, what I'd like to do today is talk about concepts of brain development, which I hope will be of interest and hopefully of relevance to all of you interested in autism research. We're interested in this phenomenon that everyone appreciates, that somehow infancy and early childhood is particularly special, that uh, we shape our identities and our behaviors through the experiences that we encounter early in life. And a flip side of this consequence, which has been appreciated for centuries, is that we as parents and educators and uh, healthcare givers are worried that <laughs> we're doing the right, right thing. And of course, this is because uh, we want to provide the appropriate opportunities for Calvin and our kids to make sure that they can uh, grow in uh, wonderful ways. And uh, what we're facing is the fact that our brains are changing and that, in fact, uh, this notion that there are critical periods or moments when our brains are sponge-like, if you will, for lack of a better word, able to absorb experiences readily or more readily than, uh, sadly, we can do as adults. However, I think this is an important um, uh, dichotomy that um, plasticity and stability are equally important. And trying to understand the mechanisms for extensive rewiring early in life, as well as the mechanisms that stabilize circuits, are um, equally important. And that's what I'd like to convey to you today. The windows of opportunity, of course, are um, accentuated by the fact that they're also windows of vulnerability. So we know that um, adverse experiences early in life will also um, tap into this plastic period and impact brain development, uh, perhaps in a negative way. And I just borrowed this slide and modified it from a review by Francis Lee and others who tried to point out that uh, many, if not all, mental illnesses may have developmental origins. And um, they focused on adolescence for a variety of these disorders, which are an increasing burden on society, not to mention on the individual. But um, here, we're interested in particular in this earlier arising uh, dis disorder, autism. And so um, what are we talking about? Essentially, we're trying to understand this gene-environment interaction. Gene programs are manifest early in utero to uh, essentially form our brains in patterns that are very similar from one person to the next, barring um, a mutation or a certain uh, genetic defect, this blueprint is uh, provided to us at birth. And then we have this moment of opportunity or vulnerability called a critical or sensitive period when our unique environments can rewire or sculpt those circuits. And that's why we speak the languages that we do, we perform the motor skills in the way we do, and have um, emotional outlook on life and so forth. And so in the lab, we're trying to understand the molecular basis for this. Why do these periods arise and why do they close? Do they really close? And if we could understand this well enough, could we in fact uh, tap into it again in moments of need such as recovery from a brain injury or an aberrant developmental trajectory? So the first notion I'd like to um, leave you with is that there are multiple critical periods, of course. There are multiple brain functions and they uh, seem to develop in a hierarchical fashion. So primary sensory areas, which are our first filters to the world, are shaped early and perhaps more uh, strictly by critical periods than uh, higher order brain areas that integrate these modalities and ultimately allow us to perform amazing uh, feats of higher cognition. And so um, the, the cellular and molecular questions we ask are, what are the mechanisms which uh, turn on these windows at these different times? What determines their duration? and what ultimately might turn them off. With the assumption here that timing is crucial, that things need to happen in sequence in order to build up higher order function, and that you could see defects or disorders arising if these time windows were to jitter. So um, I'll spend a bit of time talking about the visual system uh, because this has been the workhorse model for trying to understand the cellular basis of critical periods, at least in the cortex. 
And the reason is um, uh, several fold. Um, we know roughly what this system is supposed to do. It's to see. We can measure visual acuity from a lowly mouse all the way up to humans. There are only two sources of input, left eye and right eye. And the circuitry has been studied extensively over the decades. And we know, for example, in the mature visual system that the right eye and left eye inputs converge at the level of the primary visual cortex in the back of our brain where we can achieve um, uh, stereoscopic vision, for example. Now, in the pioneering work of Hubel and Weasel, as you all know, um, they realized that early life experience can have a profound effect on this wiring diagram. And so, uh, as in the case of humans who are born with a lazy eye, for example, where one eye is not seeing the same scene as the other, uh, the deviant eye will eventually lose visual acuity. And um, if this uh, discordant vision is not corrected in the first uh, eight, eight or nine years of life, then this declining Entwicklungspotenz, or plasticity, makes it harder and harder to um, allow normal plasticity mechanisms to wire up the brain properly. And so as a result, there is a bona fide neurodevelopmental disorder in this pathway called amblyopia, the enduring um, blunted vision as a result of a lazy eye that remains uncorrected. And there is no cure currently after the age of uh, eight or nine for amblyopia um, because uh, the cortex has passed through a critical period. And um, it's been a model for uh, developing our deeper understanding of how this might come about. Hubel and Weasel uh, took this into the lab by uh, studying first uh, kittens and then monkeys and recording um, in their Nobel Prize winning work the visual responses of cortical neurons and uh, recording the response to the two eyes and the relative strength of input from the two eyes and ultimately found that there is an anatomical consequence that uh, if you have discordant vision through the two eyes eventually the two eyes are uh, uh, represented in an unbalanced fashion. And so here you're looking at the primary visual cortex of a forward viewing animal like ourselves um, with normal vision and with one tracer injected into uh, one eye labeling uh, its targets in white and uh, in negative the black the um, ocular dominance columns as they uh, coin them of the other eye. And so you can see that roughly um, the left eye and right eye equally innervate the primary visual cortex in normal circumstances. In the lower case, they've patched an eye. No damage is done to the visual system, just an imbalance of visual experience. And then the open eye was injected with the tracer. And what you can see is that a few weeks of this experience has dramatically rewired the brain, such that the open eye now in white largely takes over the visual cortex at the expense of the deprived eye input. And so perhaps it's no wonder then, if you don't correct this early enough, there simply isn't enough real estate in the cortex to process the deviant eye input. And over the years, um, using uh, uh, molecular manipulations like uh, drugs to block particular molecules or uh, genetic approaches to target molecules that might be involved in this process, a kind of multi-step process has emerged that uh, initially there is a weakening of connections from uh, the deprived eye and a retraction of these connections thanks to molecules like proteases which might cleave the connection between input and uh, postsynaptic spine and then ultimately a, a growth process which fills in those vacated spaces with connections from the open eye. And so this is a very um, uh, well-studied model of ultimately a physical rewiring of the brain simply due to uh, activity or experience. What we want to know here is why does all of this happen so readily early in life and much less so in adulthood? And so we use the mouse model extensively. Mice, as you might know, are nocturnal. They don't use their visual system all that much. And consequently, their visual acuity is quite poor. So if you place them in front of a, a sine wave grating, the black and white stripe pattern like this, and make the pattern ever finer, the response you can record from the visual cortex, the visually evoked potential, ultimately disappears at a rather um, uh, paltry 0.5 cycles per degree. But 
if you patch one eye, as shown in the cartoon, at different times after birth to kind of simulate a uh, lazy eye situation, you find that there is a critical period. So around 20 to 40 days after birth, in the case of mice, you can uh, reduce this visual acuity enduringly. And if you do the same kind of patching later in life, you don't have this effect on acuity. And so this we take as a model of the critical period for uh, a deprivation amblyopia in humans and uh, now have the benefit of mice where you can manipulate genes. And so I'll give you the summary right now. These mice have told us uh, basically two important messages. Um, the first is the trigger of this critical period seems to reflect the maturation of inhibitory neurons, um, which was quite a surprise, and I'll unpack that as I go. Um, these inhibitory neurons secrete the neurotransmitter GABA, and um, a particular subtype of inhibitory neuron is our focus. On the flip side, once these windows are triggered, they um, run its, their course after, over a certain finite period of time. And um, this seems to reflect not only the potential loss of plasticity factors, but also the emergence of active break-like factors, which seem to suppress uh, too much rewiring. And so I'll show you examples of being able to lift those breaks and reopen plasticity uh, in adult animals, which uh, obviously may have some therapeutic value. The bottom line really is that this word, critical period, and concept, which I've been uh, using liberally so far, um, is itself plastic. And that the biological basis for turning on and turning off these windows allows us to move these windows around deliberately or uh, as a consequence of, say, some genetic perturbation, which might disrupt those factors. So this is really what I want to convey today. And I can stop and take questions or um, give you some details. So um, please don't get bogged down in the details, but I'm happy to answer along the way. Basically, um, the notion of excitatory inhibitory balance being relevant for these developmental windows came about uh, when we started looking at mutant mice which produced less GABA. And so um, this is the consequence of the fact that GABA is produced by two uh, gene products, uh, GAD65 and GAD67. If you knock out um, one of them, the animals are dying at birth. They have um, very little GABA left in their brain. If you knock out uh, GAD65, the animals survive, but curiously, their critical periods fail to begin. And so you could have a mouse growing up to be several months of age, uh, technically an adult, but not yet sensitive to patching an eye. And uh, the real breakthrough came when we could rescue these animals by restoring inhibitory function to them. We chose to do that pharmacologically. So uh, these animals secrete less neurotransmitter, less GABA. And if you give them a drug which enhances the receptor for, those, uh, for GABA, like a benzodiazepine drug, then you can, in fact, initiate the critical period not only at the usual time, but in fact any time in the animal's life, suggesting that the right level of inhibition was needed for brain plasticity. And the corollary of that was uh, even a wild-type animal could be made plastic earlier than its normal critical period if it were exposed to such a drug. And so uh, immediately you might think this has some consequences if uh, infants, for example, are exposed to such drugs, and I'll mention that uh, as I go along. So um, this was surprising because uh, inhibition was um, not uh, fully appreciated as being beneficial for plasticity. In fact, uh, at the single excitatory synapse level, routinely inhibitory transmission was blocked in experiments because inhibition was somehow preventing the uh, important trigger, say the NMDA receptor activation, for that kind of plasticity. However, in vivo, we were finding that actually you need a certain amount of inhibition for this plastic window to begin. And um, we've been working uh, very hard to try and understand how that happens. Why is inhibition beneficial for plasticity? Um, in collaboration with Ken Miller's lab and Taro Toyoizumi, um, we had an opportunity to uh, model one idea that perhaps the maturation of inhibition, in fact, uh, cleans up the signal to noise. And so in an immature system where inhibition is weak, um, there's a higher level of spontaneous activity in the brain. 
And as inhibition matures, or if we give a benzodiazepine under those conditions, in fact, the signal to noise improves because these drugs seem to preferentially dampen the spontaneous over the evoked activity. And under these conditions, uh, plasticity rules, which rely on patterns of activity, may be more effective. And so this is one uh, possibility why inhibition is required for uh, this window to begin. But um, there's more, because uh, you can manipulate inhibition in many ways. And so we knocked out GAD65 initially, which was a blunt tool. It uh, removed uh, this enzyme from all inhibitory terminals. Um, but over the years, it's now become clear that you can do this in many different ways. And I don't expect you to write any of this down. It's just to give you a flavor that uh, we can walk into our animal facility now and pull out mice whose critical periods are shifted earlier or delayed because we've manipulated the maturational time course of inhibition. Uh, we can have animals whose critical periods are extended in duration or narrowed by acting primarily on the dendritic spines of excitatory neurons and the maturation of those connections. Or we could have uh, mice which enter the critical period normally but never close their window of plasticity or as in the case of the GAD65 knockout mouse I just told you about, never open this window of plasticity. So here is suddenly an enormous toolbox with which we can ask a variety of questions. Why are these critical periods necessary? What happens if you manipulate them? And what are the consequences for cognition? So I'll give you one example of uh, a question we asked recently, which um, leverages these molecular insights. So we asked, is critical period timing determined by a clock? It happens at different times in different brain regions, so it seems reasonable to think that there's a timer somewhere in the brain. And I like this particular um, piece of art from Bertrand Plains, which uh, emphasizes the importance of our early years. Um, and to answer this question, we um, turn to clock biology. So uh, circadian clocks are uh, basically the product of a negative feedback transcriptional loop where uh, transcription factors, clock and BMAL, drive downstream circadian genes, which then inhibit this interaction. And this oscillates in a 24-hour cycle. These genes and their function were beautifully studied in the suprachiasmatic nucleus down here at the base of the brain and um, have, has provided us with a toolkit to ask this question about development. So if you zoom out of the SCN, you find that, in fact, clock is expressed everywhere. Um, and there are circadian clocks in all parts of the body and brain. But it had never been asked whether such a clock was important for developmental timing. So Yohei Kobayashi in the lab uh, dissected the visual cortex of mice in adulthood and found that over a 24-hour period, sure enough, these circadian genes oscillate not in the suprachiasmatic nucleus now, in the visual cortex. And so he looked earlier then, uh, before eye opening, which is around postnatal day 12 in the mouse, and uh, curiously found there was no such oscillation. And so uh, circadian rhythmicity, uh, I won't put it up here because it makes the graphs very cluttered, emerges in register with the onset of this visual critical period. And it, it was uh, too good to pass up to think that maybe this clock mechanism is somehow uh, contributing to the timing. So um, as an example of our usual process, we study the clock knockout mice. Clock knockout mice um, have normal circadian rhythms, but they are very blunted in uh, the circadian gene expression. And we found that the loss of visual acuity, which is seen in wild-type animals at that time period I told you about, around postnatal day 25, um, doesn't happen in these clock knockout mice. But curiously, if you wait until they grow up into adult ages, where wild-type animals are no longer plastic, so they're past their critical period, clock knockout mice suddenly become plastic. And so this uh, was a situation that we're quite familiar with. It's a delay in the onset of the critical period, and it suggested maybe there's some delay in the maturation of inhibition. And so to demonstrate that, we tried to rescue the critical period. If you give a benzodiazepine drug with deprivation, these mice become plastic at the right age. And you can simulate a visual critical period by repeated benzodiazepine enhancement of inhibition early 
and then the adult uh, plasticity disappears. So this suggested that uh, clock is somehow contributing to this excitatory inhibitory balance which triggers the critical period. There are, of course, many types of inhibitory neuron. Uh, they come in a variety of shapes and sizes and beautiful uh, connectivity. So, for example, these basket cells make uh, horizontal inhibitory projections onto neighboring, say, pyramidal neurons and innervate the cell body in a kind of pericellular basket. You'll see more of that uh, as we go on. Um, there are other cells which uh, extend their arbors up and down along the length of the column, like the double bouquet cell, or chandelier cells, which make these kind of uh, candlestick holder synapses onto the axon initial segments of neighboring neurons, exactly where action potentials are generated. And then uh, other more colorful names like long stringy cell and neurogliacorm cell. So um, we look to see which of the inhibitory neurons express clock. Uh, they all do, but overwhelmingly it was the basket cell type that um, had a high co-expression of clock. And so um, we looked at the maturation of these basket terminals. So here you see a cell body decorated normally with um, these uh, basket type synaptic boutons. But in the clock knockout mice, sure enough, they were compromised and weak early in life during the regular critical period time. That's quantified off to the right. If you patch onto one of these neurons and record the spontaneous inhibitory currents that impinge onto the cell body, normally um, you have a, oops, a certain amount of these responses, which is uh, significantly reduced, consistent with the reduced connectivity. And so this was a good bet, that the parvalbumin positive basket cell, parvalbumin being a marker of these neurons, might in fact uh, contribute to this delayed timing. And so uh, using genetic tricks, we can delete clock now just from parvalbumin cells and see if we replicate the finding of the total deletion. Um, this is possible for a variety of reasons. First of all, parvalbumin seems not to be expressed in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, so we're uh, not impacting the general circadian oscillator there. And when we do this, we find that we do replicate the total knockout phenotype, namely the deprivation during the critical period is compromised and deprivation in adult animals is present. And uh, to be extra sure, we also uh, did the same experiment with the clock partner, BMEL, and found the same result. And then uh, to be even more uh, confident of this result, we deleted clock from the excitatory neurons, which are 80% of the neurons in the cortex, so it's a much more severe deletion, uh, but these animals have no problem with uh, regular critical period plasticity. So these results taken together indicate that the maturation of parvalbumin-positive basket cells, or I'll call them PV cells for short, um, is the one that's mediating this delay of uh, timing in uh, critical period plasticity. And so, uh, indeed, there could be a cell intrinsic clock in these cells which tells the brain when to become plastic. And this result has a number of implications right away. Um, first of all, uh, if uh, inhibitory neuron maturation turns on these windows, you might imagine transplanting uh, inhibitory precursor cells and uh, creating a second critical period. And that uh, elegant work was done by Arturo Alvarez Buya's lab, um, and uh, Sunil Gandhi has followed this up and shown that you can, in fact, take embryonic precursors of these parvalbumin cells and put them into the postnatal cortex and, in fact, recreate a second critical period. And what was curious about these findings is that the second critical period comes up at a certain time when the transplanted um, uh, donor cells are about one month of age, which is the normal age that inhibitory cells would be intrinsic to the brain when the first critical period happens. So our result may uh, explain some of that intrinsic clock which determines this um, stem cell kind of approach. And for all of you, I think um, it's interesting to consider that circadian genes have been linked to a variety of mental illnesses. And of course, um, uh, this can be interpreted in terms of disrupted circadian rhythmicity. If any of you have traveled, you know that jet lag can be a real uh, uh, drag for cognition. But um, uh, it's also possible from our results that impaired oscillations during development fail to time the milestones well before 
um, these mature circadian issues come about. And so um, we think this is uh, an important direction to look. Um, can we leverage this intrinsic clock to correct um, aberrant trajectories of development? I talked about the visual system, but of course these parvalbumin cells exist uh, throughout the brain uh, and in the cortex. We can use modern techniques um, like this one called Brainbow to label uh, parvalbumin cells in technicolor with fluorescent proteins. This is uh, due to a collaboration with Jeff Lickman's lab who developed the method with Josh Sains. And what you're looking at here is um, an image stack as we're going in and out of uh, the plane of focus. And you'll see cell bodies emerging decorated with uh, synapses. And so uh, you'll see the use of this technique uh, a little later in the talk, but um, using this kind of uh, fine-scaled circuit mapping, you can uh, look when do parvalbumin circuits mature in different brain regions. And in fact, uh, they mature at different rates in different brain regions. So we've been talking about the visual cortex, whose critical period is around 20 to 40 days after birth, and parvalbumin cells mature and register with the onset of that window. But in the same mouse brain, in fact, the auditory cortex shows a much earlier maturation of parvalbumin circuits and somatosensory even earlier still. And so it's possible that these, uh, the circuit maturation of this particular subtype might contribute to that hierarchical nature of critical periods. So let's test the idea. If you go to the auditory cortex and map something of relevance there, namely uh, sound frequency, you can see a very nice critical period, which is emerging about uh, a week to 10 days before the visual critical period, as predicted. So what you see here is the best uh, sound frequency, according to this uh, heat map on the right, um, which activates neurons from the back to the front of auditory cortex. And on the right is a mouse who had been exposed to seven kilohertz tones in lime green just for three days during this postnatal day 12 to 15 period. And both recordings are made in adulthood. And so you see an enduring expansion at the expense of neighboring frequencies in the auditory cortex, very much uh, similar competitive plasticity being played out in the auditory cortex. And again, there's no damage to the system. It's just an alteration in the soundscape that the animals experienced at that particular time in life, which makes uh, the mouse in B hear the world differently than the mouse in A. Now this uh, experiment is something that we do every day with our children. So infants are born into the world able to hear the speech sounds of any language, but um, because of the native language that they're exposed to, very quickly over the first four to six months after birth, a perceptual narrowing process occurs by which uh, non-native speech sound discrimination is lost and only the native speech sounds are reinforced. This is really the first uh, step in the process to build up language, which is a beautiful uh, multi-step critical period. After this uh, phoneme discrimination, if you will, comes um, uh, audiovisual matching of the speaker's face to the sounds that the infant is hearing to make sure those align, all the way up to processing of uh, uh, grammar and, and syntax and so on. And so um, in collaboration with Janet Worker, who is a, a pioneering developmental linguist who uh, first mapped these kinds of perceptual narrowing effects in bilingual infants, um, we tested, would a critical period in humans also shift if you played with excitatory inhibitory balance? And uh, in fact, uh, we've uh, found some evidence that exposure to drugs like SRI antidepressants, which do impact excitatory inhibitory balance, do shift these milestones earlier. And so um, rather than um, uh, perceptual narrowing ending around four to six months after birth, it was closing out after just a couple months after birth. And a similar shift, earlier shift in the audiovisual matching was observed. And these are very difficult studies to control appropriately. So um, of course, you'd have to compare them to healthy infants born to healthy mothers, but also compare them to uh, infants born to depressed mothers not taking medication. And uh, curiously, we found in those groups that um, having a depressed mother actually delays these windows, suggesting that maybe uh, not enough input is uh, contributing to the delay 
and uh, we're in the process of following up what are the downstream consequences of, of shifting the timing of these very first events. Now we're here to talk about autism. Um, if you consider autism as a very complex disorder that we know it is, um, and that it's a combination of a staggered series of events which need to happen at the right time, um, even a slight jitter in primary sensory areas could cascade to have large downstream consequences on cognition. And so to test this idea, uh, we recently started looking in higher order brain regions, admittedly in the mouse, um, and we wanted to know if you go to a deliberately multimodal part of the brain, which is integrating across different sensory systems, um, would you see the impact of uh, altered critical period? We chose the insular cortex. Uh, this is a part of the brain which has been uh, implicated in a variety of um, uh, social brain type issues, uh, empathy, the recognition of pain, the perception of one's own pain, the control of urges, regulation of emotions, um, and uh, interestingly, highly multimodal, including signals, uh, internal signals, visceroceptive signals, which uh, may be a serious issue in uh, children with autism. It's called the insular cortex because it's tucked into this deep fold here in the brain in humans, uh, still rather mysterious structure, and um, lights up often in uh, many mental illnesses. In the case of mice, it's uh, right here on the side of the brain, uh, very accessible to imaging techniques. So if you uh, look at the brain with um, intrinsic fluorescence imaging method, you find that it sits here just in front of the large auditory fields that I was just talking to you about. And as advertised, it responds to sound as well as touch, like an air puff to the forepaw. And uh, as we've seen in so many sensory systems, it shows a nice developmental pruning. So in wild type uh, mice, uh, black six mice, you see that the response to a tone activates the large auditory fields as well as the insular cortex in young animals quite robustly. But this insular activation is pruned. This is a particularly dramatic example where it's almost invisible. And in register with the loss of the auditory component is an increase in multisensory integration. That is the super additive effects of stimulating with sound and touch together. Um, we started testing um, a mouse model claimed to have autistic features on this, the BTBR inbred strain, several years ago, and found that these mice fail to prune their auditory response, meaning that even in adulthood, these animals have a hypersensitivity to sound in the insular cortex which is related to pain perception. And consistent with, the, with that, uh, we find no super additive multisensory integration. And these are features that have been um, uh, reported in patients or subjects with autism spectrum disorders. A detail of interest is that the pruning seems to be in the auditory modality, not in the somatosensory modality. We can come back to that in a few seconds. Um, if we dive into the neurobiology of the insular cortex, we find that indeed it has a, a weak inhibitory system. And so if you stay, stay in forget 65 or parvalbumin and the basket cells or a structure called the perineuronal net, which reflects the mature state of these cells, they are all weaker in this mouse model. The functional consequences are consistent, so you have fewer inhibitory synaptic events if you patch onto a target cell like this. And just like in the visual system, you can boost these inhibitory currents by giving benzodiazepines. And so if you treat the animal with uh, benzodiazepines, you can, on the, on the recording table, um, acutely improve their multisensory integration. Curiously, wild-type mice, which already show superadditive effects, lose that effect, and I'll come back to that too. So we decided to try an enduring rescue strategy based on what we've done in visual cortex. So if you uh, treat the animals with benzodiazepines, specifically at the time when auditory uh, responses should be pruning, you can make these BTBR animals prune their auditory maps in the insular cortex. A similar duration of benzodiazepine treatment in older animals doesn't do this, and so it's only early treatment or early boosting of inhibition that uh, allows this pruning to proceed. And as a result, you get, uh, sorry, the pruning is here, the pruning to proceed. Um, 
And as a result, you get uh, multi-sensory integration to emerge in this BTBR mouse model. The recordings are all done here in adulthood. And so um, how does the um, rescue outlast the drug treatment? Well, it seems that boosting inhibition pharmacologically, in fact, promotes the maturation of these inhibitory circuits, and these markers all uh, get boosted um, as a consequence of this early timed treatment. Now, we thought it was rather curious that this uh, pruning is happening and multisensory integration is emerging um, at this time window because this is exactly the time when uh, earlier studies by Jack Pongsep and others had shown uh, rodents engage in social play behavior. So if you isolate uh, a rat and uh, put them back with friends, there's a dramatic boost in time they spend wrestling and pinning each other and playing, essentially uh, quantified by watching their behavior. And um, we thought it was interesting because, in fact, it was forepaw and sound stimulation which produced these uh, robust effects in the insular cortex. And that combination is ob obviously important in this kind of play behavior. Um, we found that uh, this uh, feature of the BTBR mouse, uh, stereotypical excessive grooming, um, which also obviously involves the forepaw, um, was uh, reduced as a result of this early benzodiazepine treatment. And uh, recall that these animals are showing a sub-additive response to forepaw and sound. And so it could very well be that um, this excessive grooming is a sort of self-therapy, that forepaw stimulation is blunting that hyper-responsiveness to sound in the insular cortex. And if we can correct the pruning of the auditory component early in life, they may need to groom less in part for this reason. Now you might wonder about BTBR as we did. It's one uh, mouse model um, with complex genetics, no doubt. So we also looked at other mouse models with autistic features um, and found that they have compromised multisensory integration. Um, you can rescue this if you enhance inhibition, but you don't want to go too far because uh, as I showed you briefly in wild type animals, acutely giving them benzodiazepines compromises this um, multisensory integration. And so again, the idea of a fine balance of excitation to inhibition. And um, the MECP2 knockout mice I'll tell you about uh, right now. So um, the first uh, part of the talk is longer than the second, I promise. Um, we focused a lot on this idea that um, a dynamic change in excitatory inhibitory balance is uh, what turns on these sensitivities to experience. And um, we've turned our attention to what might turn off these critical periods. If uh, we manipulate the onset, we notice that the closure would follow after some finite period of time. And so this suggests some kind of gene program is engaged that um, may eventually dampen or wind down this plasticity. And um, while there are factors that become harder to tap, um, as the critical period closes, like proteases and neurotrophins perhaps, um, there are also molecules we notice that come up with age. And um, disrupting those seem to uh, lift a break on plasticity and allow adult animals to become plastic as well. This idea was um, uh, uh, pioneered, I would say, by the observation that the very same parvalbumin cells I've been talking about, which mature to turn on the plasticity, as they pass through the critical period, wrap themselves up in this structure called the perineuronal net, which is an extracellular matrix that tightly binds around these cells. And um, here's an image of uh, one of these nets. You see that it, it forms a kind of um, glove around the cell has been cut in half here, so you can see from the inside as well, um, uh, the, the cell body and proximal neurites. In purple now you see the inhibitory synapses from other parvalbumin cells that are impinging through that net onto the target cell. So that's the structure that um, emerges as the critical period is closing. And in pioneering work, Tommaso Pizzurusso showed that you can uh, destroy these nets by an enzymatic treatment in the adult uh, visual cortex. And what that does is actually reopens plasticity. And so that was a rather curious finding, um, which has focused our attention of um, uh, trying to understand what components of this uh, net are important for plasticity regulation. And uh, in fact, um, 
the question of EI balance, which is such a vague and somewhat annoying uh, uh, term, um, can be reduced to this one cell as far as critical periods are concerned because these uh, um, nets are in fact um, perforated by both excitatory and inhibitory synapses and we know that removing the net from these cells is sufficient to reopen the critical period type plasticity. So um, let me give you some quick examples that in fact these cells themselves are very plastic. So um, this had not been known whether inhibitory neurons respond to patching an eye. Uh, and in fact, we now know that if you do that, patch an eye, whether it's in a mouse, as we showed uh, first in 2009, or in a kitten model here by Marcos Frank's group, it's these inhibitory interneurons which are first to change, and then later the excitatory pyramidal neurons which shift in favor of the open eye. The inhibitory interneurons, in fact, shift in favor of the closed eye first, and then later in favor of the open eye. And um, this can happen within a day of deprivation. Um, and this was shown by Sandy Kuhlman and uh, Josh Trachtenberg's lab, that parvalbumin positive neurons in particular seem to be the first responders to patching an eye. And so um, we recently looked for the excitatory synapses which might underlie this change. Um, basically, you can prepare a slice preparation which uh, preserves the connection from the visual thalamus to these fast spiking cells. And um, uh, if you do that, you can stimulate the visual thalamus and look at the specific connection to visual cortex and find that, um, as, as shown in this voltage sensitive dye image, um, the response here in visual cortex is much stronger onto these uh, inhibitory neurons than onto excitatory neurons. And in fact, if you patch an eye, it's this inhibitory cell which is most plastic. It loses 50% of its uh, thalamic input by patching an eye. We now know this happens within an hour or two of closing an eye. So um, uh, the consequences, again, are anatomical. Um, if you look at the cell bodies um, of these inhibitory neurons and count the excitatory thalamic inputs to them, you see that they are uh, reduced first in size and then in number. And this is exactly where those perineuronal nets are uh, trapping these inputs. But we shouldn't forget that there are inhibitory inputs. So here's a, an, an artist's rendering of these perineuronal nets um, punctured by synapses coming in. We don't know the identity of these synapses. I just told you that excitatory inputs are plastic, highly plastic, onto these sites. But what about inhibitory synapses? In fact, if you were to look down from the surface onto one of these uh, basket-type cells, they make extensive lateral inhibitory connections, and these red dots are all other fast-spiking parvalbumin cells. So they make extensive inhibitory inputs onto each other, and um, we shouldn't forget about those. They make basket-type contacts onto each other. And in fact, it's this connection which is very uh, sensitive to experience. So if we uh, label the inhibitory inputs onto other inhibitory cells, and then um, look at the effects of, say, dark rearing, raising an animal in total darkness, we find that there's a 40 to 50% reduction in those PV to PV connections, whereas there's no effect on the PV to excitatory connections. And uh, this reduction is, in fact, an arrested development. This is the level of um, a postnatal day 15 animal just, just after eye opening. And if you take the animals out of the dark, um, the, the uh, connections recover. A basket synapse looks something like this, a cell body surrounded by a nest of uh, inhibitory contacts. And so um, this was a drawing from Cajal. But now with the rainbow techniques that I mentioned, you can in fact label each one of those contacts with a different color and ask uh, very basic questions. Is this uh, loss of input to inhibitory neurons due to the loss of convergence? And in fact, we now know that there is a, a loss, a 50% loss of convergence onto these cells. I'm happy to talk more about this unpublished work at the end uh, in, in the question session. I just want to go back to autism in the last few minutes um, because these parvalbumin circuits are particularly uh, relevant, we think, for developmental trajectories in these disorders. We worked a lot on a monogenic uh, mouse model 
of Rett syndrome uh, in collaboration with Michaela Fagiolini's lab at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, if you look in the visual cortex of these animals, we find that their inhibitory basket type circuits are hyper mature. So you see that um, they have a, a much more robust connectivity to target cells and the staining is much stronger. More recently, Anarita Patrizzi has started looking in human post-mortem tissue from neurotypical controls and brain bank material from Rett syndrome subjects and finding similar kinds of hyper-mature uh, parvalbumin circuits. If you look at the perineuronal nets, as I just told you, a signature of the fully mature um, inhibitory neuron, you find that at a young age, the nets are quite sparse in wild-type animals, and they don't have that extensive labeling of the proximal neurites. But at the same postnatal day 30, the Rett syndrome uh, mice have very heavy nets, so heavy the film doesn't rotate fast enough. <laughs> but um, I hope you saw in the first uh, instance, <laughs> having trouble with this video, um, yeah that there are extensive uh, nets on these uh, parvalbumin cells and they're much tighter, um, something we're trying to quantify using methods like uh, super resolu resolution microscopy. These mice show uh, a maturation and regression of visual function. Um, I was very pleased to see just a few weeks ago, Josh Wang's lab studying these mice found that in fact, as you might predict from a hyper mature parvalbumin circuitry, the critical period is shifted earlier in these mice. So that's schematized here. The parvalbumin cells are maturing already at eye opening, and monocular deprivation, this patching of an eye, which is totally effective in wild-type mice, leading to the loss of deprived eye activation of the visual cortex, this is using an imaging technique, um, fails to occur at, in these animals that's shown here. So uh, when wild-type mice are plastic, these mice are not. And the reason is they were already plastic earlier. Their critical period had started already at postnatal day 15. And uh, they can rescue these mice and bump later their critical period by um, uh, compromising the inhibitory function of these parvalbumin cells in these animals. So here's a case of a mouse model, a monogenic mouse model of a human disorder where the critical period timing has shifted earlier than normal. So you can, it can go both ways. It's not always slower. Um, interestingly, in the same paper, they show that it's the parvalbumin to parvalbumin connection in particular, which is um, uh, altered. So here they've measured the response to firing a train of action potentials in the presynaptic cell, and the degree of depression or weakening of the response is blunted compared to wild-type mice, whereas the parvalbumin to pyramidal or excitatory neuron is uh, not, com uh, not compromised in the same way. So um, I just mentioned MECP2 as an example because uh, this is uh, one way we hope to get into uh, something that could be relevant to the human condition. MECP2 deletion causes uh, uh, phenotype in mice that is similar in some ways to the human. Uh, if you uh, lift the mouse by its tail, you have uh, hind limb clasping. Um, this is a, a, a feature of uh, the young girls who are clasping their hands and hand wringing. But uh, the visual system turned out to be quite a useful model because you see that there is a loss of visual acuity in the mouse. And we now know a loss of visual acuity in the patients. This is work by Michaela Fagellini and Chuck Nelson, just published in Annals of Neurology. And if you look at the waveform of the visually evoked potential, you can categorize the severity of the regression, the overall behavioral regression in these animals as well as in the humans, just by the waveform alteration from away from the black uh, neurotypical control. And so we're hoping that um, this close uh, communication between animal model and the clinic uh, will allow us to test some ideas. The idea that we're really interested in is what is the net providing? The perineuronal net might be one way to trap a variety of factors um, which are not made by these inhibitory neurons, but they are exquisitely sensitive to them. They have receptors or they, they require these factors to maintain a fully mature uh, function. And so if you remove these nets, you would deplete these inhibitory neurons of their 
um, uh, factors. And in fact, this has been done. Um, you can knock down, uh, for example, one of these factors, OTX2, and make an adult animal young again. So um, this is an adult animal where patching an eye no longer has this effect on visual acuity. But if you deplete one of these um, non-cell autonomous factors, you can reopen plasticity or restore visual acuity from a previous deprivation, for example. And so I think the day is coming soon where we might be able to uh, uh, leverage or reverse engineer these critical periods in some way to reopen a, a, a second window of plasticity. Um, and I'll just leave you with um, uh, a summary diagram that um, I focused a lot on perineuronal nets, which are uh, wrapping around these parvalbumin cells, um, interacting with excitatory neurons. But um, there are a variety of molecules that these inhibitory cells uh, express uh, in order to make sure that they develop and stay mature at the right times. And so uh, one strategy I just alluded to is to uh, remove or manipulate those uh, non-cell autonomous factors from uh, the brain in order to reset a critical period. Another is uh, an interesting series of experiments I didn't uh, put in the talk, but happy to show you in questions, um, which involve uh, neuromodulation, probably through a different inhibitory neuron which inhibits these parvalbumin cells or um, this idea of transplanting inhibitory neurons that provide this kind of youthful uh, environment for plasticity. Okay. I have no time left. So <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that um, reopening plasticity is something we want to do with caution. So um, I used the perineuronal net as an example um, because uh, we don't think it's necessarily a good idea to do this um, uh, for a prolonged period of time. Here you see the maturation of these nets in the human post-mortem brain of neurotypical subjects from uh, 42 days old to four years, 13 years, and 20 years of age in the prefrontal cortex. And uh, as expected for this late developing part of our brain, these nets emerge slowly. In this study by Sabina Beretta, she looked then at the postmortem tissue from schizophrenic uh, patients and found that these nets are compromised and don't um, uh, fully form. And in collaborative work with Kim Doe's lab, we found that these nets actually have another function, which is to protect these fast spiking, highly metabolically active, and therefore very vulnerable cells from oxidative stress. And so um, this is seen again in Alzheimer's disease as well. And so what I'd like to leave you with is that um, these mechanisms for turning on and turning off critical periods have evolved for a reason. And that uh, we're just now scratching the surface of what might um, allow these windows to happen when they do. And in the lab, we can do proof of concept experiments to say, lift a break. But in mental illness, it's possible that these windows are shifted because there's some uh, defect or oxidative stress which compromises the development of the inhibition which turns it on in the first place, or the maintenance of these other factors which are supposed to turn it off. And so um, you might have situations in uh, the prodrome, the long onset to schizophrenia, where there's excessive plasticity before perhaps a degeneration occurs. And so I'll leave you with the words of Baudelaire. Um, what we're hoping to do is to find a way to recover plasticity at will, but not have these bad side effects. And um, this is something that obviously uh, will take us some time, but I wanted to end with a word of caution. Um, what I've told you today is that critical periods themselves are plastic, and uh, they reflect the trajectory of excitatory inhibitory balance, especially particular form of inhibition. And um, once triggered, they close because of brake like factors which are expressed at quite a bit of biological cost throughout life. Mistiming of these windows um, may uh, play some role in neurodevelopmental disorders, and mistiming can be too early, too late, or a failure to close. I told you about the work of many people who I've mentioned on the slides as I went through. Um, 
also uh, several outstanding uh, lab members now have gone on to uh, head their own labs. And um, I would like to thank uh, the funding agencies, in particular the Conti Center, uh, which uh, I run and collaborate with Jeff Lickman and Catherine Dulac. I know Catherine is coming next month, so you'll hear more from her. I'll stop here and take questions. Thanks.